Hello everyone. Today we will be talking about premenstrual syndrome or premenstrual tension or PMS what regularly patients say what everyone talks about. Premenstrual syndrome or premenstrual tension is a very common thing that is occurring very commonly in women from 30 to 45 years of age and let us understand what it is. Okay, let us talk about the syndrome the syndrome. Why syndrome? Because it is not a single thing. There are so many things associated with it. Premenstrual syndrome is a psycho, neuro, endocrine, three things. Psycho, neuro, endocrine disorder of unknown etiology often noticed just prior to menstruation because it gives you depression, anxiety and it is related to hormones also. So, it is a syndrome. There is cyclic appearance of a large number of symptoms during the last 7 to 10 days of the menstrual cycle. Very important. In the last week when you are expecting the menses, the menses are about to happen. At that time a set of symptoms appear which are psycho neuroendocrine. So, this is called as the premenstrual syndrome. Now diagnosis. First of all when a patient comes to us it is a very vague thing. How do you stamp? How do you label that this patient is having PMS and nothing else? Because there is no definite etiology, you, it is a diagnosis of exclusion, right? So, according to the American Psychiatric Association and DSM, Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, symptoms to be confirmed by prospective patient mood charting for at least two menstrual cycles. Patient comes and says that I am facing this symptom since last say six months or one year, but you will not believe on that. Okay, we will think about it that yes, it is there, but you will have to go prospective in the coming. Prospective means in future. You will have to study the patient for at least two cycles and notice the symptoms by yourself. Common psychiatric conditions like depression, anxiety and other medical disorders are excluded. The patient should not be suffering from other psychiatric problems like depression, anxiety or she must not be on other medications which can lead to mood disorders. So, it is a diagnosis of exclusion. Now, it is very very important to understand this chart. Presence of symptoms at least 5 or more must occur. They occur in most cycles during the week before the menses and improve within a few days after the onset of menses and diminish in the week post menses. What does that mean? The symptoms that we are talking along list of symptoms we are having, at least more than 5 of the symptoms should be there and it should be like this. The graph should go like this. It is the menstrual cycle, it is the ovulatory phase it is the menstrual phase. So, the symptoms should increase premenstrually and decrease drastically once the patient has started menstruating. So, it should be premenstrual and it should improve by itself within a few days of menses. Then only then we can say that these symptoms can be associated with PMS. Now, of those five symptoms, at least one or more of the following symptoms should be there. What are they? Marked affective liability of the mood, mood swings, tearfulness, feeling of rejection, irritability, anger, increased interpersonal conflicts. Most of the times the couple come to us that there is increased chances of quarrels, interpersonal conflicts in the premenstrual phase. Marked depressed moods, feeling of hopelessness, self depreciating thoughts, anxiety, tension. Whatever mood swings, tearfulness, rejection, wastefulness, hopefulness, whatever we study in depression, all of those symptoms start coming in the premenstrual phase. So, one or more of these symptoms should be present in the list of those five symptoms. One or more of the following should be present. It was related to depression. Now, Decreased interest in the usual activities, what usually used to like going to school, going to your workplace, meeting your friends. Earlier it used to be very cheerful, but now no interest in those activities. Difficulty in concentrating, 
easy fatigability, low energy state, all the time lethargic, hypersomnia or insomnia, binge eating, food cravings, these are all depression. You are not interested in anything. Every time you are sleeping, sleeping, sleeping or you are not able to sleep at all, the sleep cycle is disturbed. The food habits are disturbed, just sitting and going on eating, eating just because you are feeling hopeless. Feelings of being overwhelmed. Physical symptoms such as, yeah, very important, breast tenderness, joint aches, bloating, weight gain, this all happens premenstrually. So, the criteria A to C must be present in most of the menstrual cycles in the last year. The feeling of depression, anxiety, anger, wastefulness, breast tenderness, bloating, rejection, this all should be present in most of the cycles in the last year according to the patient's history, patient symptoms. Now, the symptoms are associated with significant distress or interference with work, school or relationships. The patient is suffering so much that the family gets disturbed, the workplace gets disturbed, everyone is affected so much because of the mood liability of the patient. The disturbance is not merely an exacerbation of another disorder such as major depression panic disorder that we have already talked about that you should rule other psychiatric illness which is leading to this. If the patient is the mental state examination is normal, only then we think about PMS. Criteria A, what was that? It was about like more than 5 of the symptoms, right? Should be confirmed by prospective daily ratings. This is what I was talking. The criteria A was talking about what patient uh, uh, told us, right? That I was having this symptom, I was having this symptom. Okay, you listen to that, but you confirm prospectively in the coming two cycles. The symptoms are not due to physiological effects of drug abuse or other medical conditions like hyperthyroidism. So, before stamping any patient having PMS, you will have to rule out any other psychiatric disorder, you will have to rule out any other medical disorder. Now, pathophysiology, as uh, in every lecture, we try to understand why a thing is occurring because until and unless we go to the deep basic, how will we treat the condition? The exact cause is not known, but there are so many hypotheses. Alteration in the level of the estrogen and progesterone starting from the mid luteal phase. Generally what happens, it is estrogen related illness and uh, the normal levels of estrogen progesterone, they start uh, changing, the, there is imbalance in the mid luteal phase, estrogen is high or the progesterone is low, then the patient may have symptoms of this. So, th either there is altered estrogen progesterone ratio or diminished progesterone level. Neuroendocrine factors during the luteal phase decrease synthesis of serotonin is also observed in women suffering from PMS, right? So, the mood elevating things, the endorphins, the serotonin, these are all disturbed and there is disturbance in estrogen progesterone. Endorphins, which are the happy hormones. So, withdrawal of endorphins or neurotransmitters from CNS during the luteal phase occurs and the patient starts feeling depressed. GABA, gamma amino butyric acid suppresses the anxiety level in the brain and so any medication which is a GABA agonist is going to help in this. Because the medication is helping that is why we are thinking that probably GABA or serotonin or endorphins are related to this disease. Psychological and psychosocial factors may be involved, we do not know. So, it is a multifactorial etiology and the correct pathophysiology no one knows. Now, how do we approach the patient? Whenever we are talking about management, we will always start from the clinical features. So, the age is 30 to 45 years of age. This is more common, but it is not a watertight compartment. It may be related to childbirth or any disturbing life event. There are no abnormal pelvic findings except features of pelvic congestion. Pelvic congestion generally occurs after progesterone, we know that, that after ovulation a bit of pelvic congestion is there, it may lead to PMS and some disturbing event or whatever, there are some problems in the family, there are some psychosocial factors which can lead to these disturbances. Now, how to manage? 1, 2, 3, 4, we will not step directly to the pharmacological measures because this is a psychosocial neuroendocrine whatever disorder. So, we will have to manage it by psychotherapy. 
assurance. Tell the patient that you are suffering from a problem and try to fight it out by yourself. Yoga, stress management, diet manipulation, the patient keeps on eating, eating, binge eating, depression. Try to control that diet. Try to shift the patient to better exercise modules. Avoidance of salt, caffeine and alcohol, especially in the second half of the cycle because all of this may lead to sleeplessness and other problems. So let's avoid excessive salt, excessive snacks, caffeine, alcohol in the second half of the cycle. Role of exercises is very, very good. 30 minutes of daily exercise, mostly of the week, including the luteal phase, may decrease the symptoms very well. Lifestyle modification, cognitive and behavioral therapy, definitely. These are all lifestyle modifications which lead to a healthy lifestyle and a sense of well-being. Now, non-hormonal medication. See, we know the problem lies in ovulation. That's why there is some disturbance in the after the mid luteal phase. So, what do we do? Initially, non-hormonal medications which is pyridoxin. Why pyridoxin? Pyridoxin is helpful because it helps in maintaining the tryptophan which is generally associated with pill associated depression. So, tablets of pyridoxin 100 milligram twice a day may help. We may start with it because it is like non-hormonal medication and there are less side effects. Diuretics in the second half of the cycle like furosemide 20 mg daily for consecutive 5 days a week may decrease fluid retention. So, the problem of weight gain, bloating, breast tenderness may reduce. But these are all cyclic things, you cannot keep on giving these things. Now, drugs. What all drugs can be easily used? SSRI, SNRI, TCAs and benzodiazepines. These are generally all anti-anxiety, anti-depression medications. Selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, serotonin noradrenergic reuptake inhibitors, tricyclic and tetracyclic antidepressant and benzodiazepines. We have read it about it in our pharmacology lectures. So, indications generally depression, anxiety, PMS, all anxiety disorders, we can try one drug or another dose according to the patient's weight and what the patient demands. Example of these drugs, SSRIs are fluoxetin, most commonly used in gynae practice. Citalopram, acetalopram, sertraline, paroxetine, whatever suits to your patient. SNRI, venlafaxine, duloxetine. TCAs, generally nortriptyline and amitriptyline. And benzodiazepines, alprazolam, clonazepam, diazepam, whatever is available and it helps patient reduce the anxiety levels. But generally fluoxetine, venlafaxin, amitriptyline, they work very well. Common side effects, we need to talk about the side effects to counsel our patient that nausea, headache, insomnia, diarrhea, dry mouth, sexual dysfunction, dizziness, constipation, dry mouth, anxiety, agitation. Dry mouth is common, see dry mouth, dry mouth, dry mouth because it occurs in everything which is reuptake inhibitor. Drowsiness, dizziness, blurred vision, urinary frequency, drowsiness, impaired memory, ataxia, hypotension. So, it is very difficult to learn them one by one but generally because these are calming agents so depression, <coughs> sorry dry mouth, nausea, dizziness that is going to happen. Now, if all these therapies are not working, pyridoxine is not working, patient is not satisfied with diuretics and small doses of these anti-anxiety drugs, then definitely we will have to move towards the hormonal medications. Basic idea is to disrupt the ovarian cycle so that there is no interplay of hormones left. Oral contraceptive pills. We know OC pills. OC pills cause anovulation. So, the idea is to suppress the ovulation and to maintain a uniform hormonal milieu so that there is no ups and down in estrogen and progesterone and there is no problem with the patient. The therapy is to be continued for 3 to 6 cycles. Progesterone generally is not effective in treating PMS but yes, Mirena or Levonorgestrel IUD 
can be helpful. Why? Because it helps in suppressing the ovulation, not because of the progesterone itself, but because it suppresses ovulation. So, idea behind hormonal therapy, see we have tried to deal with the symptoms, but the, if the patient is not happy with dealing with the symptoms, we will have to remove the root, which is ovulation. So, you can give OC pills to stop ovulation, you can give LNG IUD to stop ovulation, Spironolactone. Spironolactone is a potassium sparing diuretic if patient is not happy with furosemide. Bromocryptin 2.5 milligram daily or twice daily may be helpful mainly in the breast thing because it deals with prolactin, right? Now, other agents which could be used, denazol, but generally it has very, very high side effects. So, we are not using denazol. But yes, GnRH analogs and GnRH agonists have got magical effects on PMS. The gonadal steroids are suppressed by administration of GnRH agonists for 6 months or the other name is medical oophorectomy. In other things, we are just suppressing the ovulation, but there are hormones in the body. We are maintaining a normal hormonal milieu, but there are hormones. If it is not working, just take away the hormones from the body, do a medical oophorectomy, give GnRH analogs. We have already studied that what do GnRH analogs do? It decreases permanently from the hypothalamo pituitary axis and there is no FSH, no LH surge. So, there is practically no hormones in the body. It is just like a postmenopausal state. So, giving 6 months, it gives magics to the patient. Result of GnRH agonist therapy are dramatic. GnRH agonist combined with the add back estrogen progesterone. We have already talked about this in previous lectures. What is add back? Because it is a medical oophorectomy, we have taken practically all hormones from the body. So, the body needs a little bit of hormones to maintain the calcium metabolism and the other postmenopausal changes from the body. So, we will give a bit of estrogen and progesterone, not to that level that it causes PMS, but a little bit of it to maintain the normal metabolism of the body. But yes, GnRH agonist therapy with add back helps to fight the symptoms very, very dramatically in cases of PMS. Oophorectomy. In established cases of primary PMS, primary means there is no other cause. With recurrence of symptoms, even after giving so many medications and the patient is so much frustrated and the patient is already approaching the menopause, so hysterectomy with bilateral oophorectomy is the last resort. With this, I am finishing off PMS. It is a bit boring topic, but very, very important from your exam points of view. Thank you so much.